Okay, I'm coming. Join. What's the name of it? Five six one. Anybody have the meeting number handy? Five six one. Mm -hmm. Nine two five. Nine two five. Nine two eight. Nine two eight. Here we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, so we're seeing your screen now, Jeremy? Yeah, so there's, there's something going on here. So it turns out I, I was speculating that what I was working on, maybe you would be able to tie it to some of the things that we wanted to talk about. But as it's turned out, it ties very directly to what we've just talked about. So what's going on here is I am finally adding an editing toolbar to TiddlyWiki. So you will be able to um, type some text, select a piece of it, and press a button to make it go bold, or press a pull-down menu to choose from a range of useful widgets or headings and so on. Um, <clears throat> and the history of this is whenever you show people a wiki like TiddlyWiki, one of the things that people, an enormous number of people say, a big proportion of people say is, we need a rich text editor. And then when you probe a bit more deeply, what they actually mean is we need this toolbar. Um, weirdly, they're, they're quite happy with the idea that when you press the bold button, something other than the text appearing bold happens. It's the kind of comfort factor, I've come to believe. Um, but there is an undeniably great value in what these buttons here are a specific case of, which is, um, having operations that you can perform on the text as you're working on it. So most of TiddlyWiki, the mechanisms are concerned, as we've discussed endlessly, um, with tiddlers as atomic units and how they interact and we can make various kinds of relationships between them, such as links and transclusion and so on. But everything that happens, happens sort of between tiddlers, if you see what I mean. Um, and TiddlyWiki has... Um, uh, has very little to say about manipulating individual tiddlers, if you see what I mean. It presents them for editing in a text area, but that's about it. What this lets us do is can develop ways of um, encapsulating quite complex operations um, that can then be carried out on the text that's being edited. So this other dimension of, edit uh, of editing where sort of cha um, there's the process of changing tiddlers and that changes how the entire wiki is displayed. And then there's the process of editing a chunk of text. So we can enhance that. So that, for instance, um, the classic refactoring that we've talked about before is being able to um, select a piece of text and press a button to say, make that selected text into a new tiddler and um, uh, replace it here with a transclusion of that tiddler. And um, I've long thought that being able to do that in a single operation, you know, in a way that's cognitively simple while you're in the middle of writing would be unbelievably useful because of the way that although we value cutting up text into small chunks, most text is written still in sort of long tracts that then need sort of splitting apart. So <clears throat> I'm very excited about this change because it answers something that lots of people want or think that they want, um, that it opens up a whole new dimension of operations within TiddlyWiki, that instead of being operations within t uh, between tiddlers, are operations on text as you're editing it. So extending the kind of um, uh, hypertext, hypertypewriter. Can I say that? Hyper, a hyperwriter. So there is somewhere within all wikis, there is a tool for manipulating text, selecting a word, replacing it with something else. And it's that that we're enhancing here. And we're enhancing in the same way that TiddlyWiki itself is extensible and open ended so that individuals can extend, um, you know, can write plugins that extend the thing with very. Um, domain specific operations. You know, you might have some SUNY specific operations or some design right specific editing operations, that kind of thing. Here, does that make sense to you what he's talking about? So. Would 
Do you see how it's, he's working at like two levels? No. Um, James, you get, you get what he's doing there? Um, I have a question that, that might help me figure this out. So the text, text is just the name of a field in a tidbit. That's right. And one and text has as a field has certain characteristics, such that yeah. no. Okay, so currently text as a field has certain characteristics because it's displayed as a it's displayed in that window. When the when the tiddler, so it's actually the the type <laughs> that's associated with the tiddler yeah. that makes the text field be displayed in that way as a big um, as a big chunk of text. So, is there any reason that you couldn't apply all of the logic that you were just talking about to multiple fields in the same tiddler? Oh no, not at all. Okay. So, your your um, when I was saying text there, I yeah. meant um, in a, I think in a slightly technical way that if I do a view source you'll see that in HTML, there's a thing called a text area. Mm -hmm. And it's very familiar. It's the, yeah. it's the box that lets you edit text within it. So when I was talking about manipulating text, I meant manipulating um, uh, and interacting yeah. with text within a text area. Okay. Yeah, so we'd be able to do all of that. And so I think in some ways that um, me and others um, get buy too much into the model of a tiddler as having a single text field. And maybe if tiddlers had two text fields, text one and text two, that were sort of could potentially operate independently of each other, um, that would be, you know, I mean, and obviously we could do that, we just don't. Yeah, so I think, I think what you're, you're touching on here is there are elements of TiddlyWiki that are entirely convention. So we could have text one, text two, text three, absolutely nothing is, stop it, nothing is stopping us doing that now. And it's quite an interesting thing to explore, particularly with multilingual stuff. So text um, dash fr, dash fr, et, et cetera. Um, uh, but yeah, we, the, the conventions that we establish allow us to communicate and give us common ground, but they also constrain our thinking. And um, sometimes it's useful to kind of um, possibly for us to enumerate our, the conventions that we're using so that we can kind of critique them and question what it would be like to step outside that convention. And this, that's a good case in point. But, but this, I mean, we could do this to when we're editing individual fields um, was, was your question. So the capability here is um, we've always had, this is the current TiddlyWiki as it is on TiddlyWiki.com. So we've always had support for a text area and in technical terms, it's a more sophisticated one than usual because it resizes itself automatically to track its content. And so here, this is precisely the same thing. It's still a text area, but enhanced with this toolbar. Now, in fact, the reason why it's taken so long is that if I back in the current TiddlyWiki, if I select some text that I want to make bold, say, as soon as I click anywhere outside the text editor, it loses what we call the focus, which is that blue rectangle, and it loses the selection as well. Um, and so the, uh, the thing that I learned how to do, which uh, sadly is one of those things that other people learned how to do long ago, but it's a technique that had been lost in the mists of time, um, allows us to now have selected text, and when I click one of those buttons, um, we don't lose the selection. So it's that... It's figuring out this very minor technical capability that has unleashed um, a feature that, it, it, apart from that problem, every other aspect of it has always been reasonably straightforward, and if not straightforward, then fun to do. Right. So I think it has some relevance for, for your course. I mean, so just going through a couple of meta levels, um, it's, you've got a problem with TiddlyWiki's approachability for the students, and um, so let's hope that one of the side effects of doing this is um, we make, and we'll make some other changes to kind of clear things up. We don't need that text there anymore, for instance, but we'll um, clean this up a bit and hope perhaps that'll make it a bit easier, less frightening um, for students. Um, and of course, it, in terms of the course and hypertext writing, it now allows you to explore these 
multiple levels in which we're writing and in which we're manipulating text. We're manipulating text here as a string of characters, exactly as if it was in Word, but we're using these extensible operations to um, encapsulate complex things that we want to do to the text. And we're also doing the things we've always done in TiddlyWiki in terms of combining tiddlers and making relationships between tiddlers to produce this, you know, the entire user interface. Yeah, no, that's very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. That, and that should be what next week, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Well, certainly in the ne by next week, there'll be something online for- I was kidding. kidding. <laughs> Actually, I kind of wanted to see if you would mind, would you spend like just two, three minutes talking a little bit about that because- the, um, Talking about? The, 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 how a program like TiddlyWiki gets a modification like that, what's the process that you go through to run things like that and change things? And you say, oh, well, by the end of the week, there'll be a little bit of it. But when Google does this or Word does this, I imagine it takes a little bit longer. Yeah, one of the things that's um, good about TiddlyWiki is it's a relatively, it's an enormous piece of software. I mean, it's been, um, I um, have worked on, I've done most of the work on it and I've worked on it for quite a long time, um, you know, but quite persistently. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but it's highly modular. And so there is, there's a class of changes that are incredibly tricky. So the things that thread through lots of modules within the system are really tough. But there's another class of um, alterations that are both conceptually and practically very simple, which is when you, um, notably when you replace one module with another module or you, know, you modify a module to, to turn it into a new module. And that's the case here, that there was already a component um, uh, that's the edit text um, widget. Yeah. Um, and so I've replaced it, in fact, in a rather clumsy way. Let me, um, well, I need I, 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 to kind of get to that because without spending a lot of time on the general idea, the, the, the concept of modular programming, small chunks that can easily be changed, swapped in, swapped out, is really the way that yes. information designers and programmers live in the same world. When you're writing on a website, Yes. Somebody says, can you change this? You don't change the whole thing. You change a little teeny piece of it. You pull it out, put something else in, and hopefully it all, and then it will all continue to flow if you've built it together. So students in communication yeah. information design, our undergraduates and our graduate students in information design technology, see, learn, have learned that from the coder side to modularize yes. and keep track of their stuff and keep control of all their pieces, you know. Um, there's, a, there's perhaps a sense in which, because I'm a programmer, TiddlyWiki has been, been designed from the inside out. It's been designed from the mechanisms outwards with a goal in mind. Whereas if I wasn't a developer, I'd have had to have designed the experience of it and then explained it to a developer and got them to design the inside of it. So um, I, I personally think with software, that's quite a big deal. There's quite a lot of software out there that was designed from the outside, so to speak. Somebody without any insight into building the insides of it determined what the outsides of it should look like, and then somebody else filled that in. And a lot of the time, for software that we largely understand, that's a great approach. You know, If you're building another piece of video conferencing software, that's probably what you want, is somebody who's an expert user of video conferencing software to kind of design it and then get a programmer to just fill in all the, all the boring technical details. But with something like TiddlyWiki, um, it, um, I, I think it needs that sense of being designed um, uh, from the inside out, you know, um, so the, yeah. the, and the, prog the programming, yeah. developing the programming went hand in hand with developing the concepts um, and you know, even refining the purpose of the thing. So the other um, small piece that I, that I pitched TiddlyWiki as as an opportunity is for information designers who want to build something like a wireframe in a sense or a prototype yeah. and how they want something to work and then we'll turn it over to a designer and a programmer or to a programmer to actually make it work when we want to scale. And then that's where I think Kier's idea of mass editing Tiddlers has resonance. 
That's yeah. what allows you to mass edit or mass produce, really, <clears throat> bunches yeah. of tiddlers. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. in the post-production phase, if it's an app that's downloaded on your phone or if you're writing an encyclopedia of plants, you don't, as a writer, you still, they, all those plant pages just change when I made this one change. And if yeah. you think of that as editing, I guess I could live with that. Yeah. But in a designing and writing interactive text class, I want you to think of that as templated. So that you don't have to think that I have to edit all thousand pages of my encyclopedia. I only have to edit the template. And then that's the what that does is gives you power as a designer to understand that if I work on templates, I can have massive impact. And it's not like I have to open every page, like in a yeah. environment, strip out the footer and put paste in a new, you know, literally paste in a new piece of tape as the border and go to the next right. page. That we did that for 500 years when we made books. But something changed when hypertext, no, okay. when the digital, yeah, okay, so you get it. I'm not going to belabor that point. Do you, Kira, do you use um, Photoshop or Illustrator by any chance? I have a little bit. I usually use Inkscape and GIMP, which are open source equivalents. Oh, okay, great. Um, because I, I think there's an analog for this conversation with those tools that um, with, uh, and, and for, um, I think you'll know them much better than me. I've played with them in the past, but um, an, an, an observation about those, that class of tools in general, um, you know, vector editing tools, is they provide lots of primitives um, that let you draw lots of things and then you make those things increasingly complex by adding more and more primitives to them. And then, um, what's often frustrating is that in the finished drawing, you've lost any sense of structure. And there are changes that are semantically perfectly meaningful, make all of the speech bubbles um, have a bigger outline. And yet, making that change in some situations can be quite tough because the speech bubbles metaphorically be made up of a, you know, a rectangle and a triangle that are, that are separate components. And so um, I, I use a tool called Sketch on the Mac, which is, you know, it's not open source, but it's a, um, it's a kind of fancy um, vector editing tool. Um, and that has something called symbols, which allows you to create bits of shapes and then replicate them. And it's, it allows you to do some really phenomenal things. You can have a bunch of buttons on a web page and then change the master template for the button and all of the buttons on the page change. So it's, it's a feature, and those features, I think there's equivalence in Photoshop and Illustrator now, and maybe therefore in, in uh, GIMP and in Inkscape. Um, but I think what Hypertext is trying to do is, is, is give us a, a consistent sort of minimal model um, for how you do that. Whereas on these, um, in the vector graphics space, I don't think we've got such a successful mental model um, for how you reuse content, I'm sorry, reuse shapes <laughs> and their attributes in order to have this kind of common control um, by retaining the structure. Okay. So one of the things that I'm, um, that's amazing about HTML5 is that SVG, um, vector images on the web, are actually made up of HTML elements. And so... Um, TiddlyWiki5 can generate and manipulate SVG in exactly the same way that it does HTML. So one of its untapped latent potentials um, is to make it be a, an illustrator competitor. So a, 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 a tool for producing illustrations, um, but that those illustrations would be composed of tiddlers, which would be lots of primitives, um, uh, visual primitives, um, that would be replicated. There'd need to be a certain amount of drag and drop and so on in order to arrange things. Um, but the idea would be you could produce very semantic diagrams, diagrams that you could change the language of, for instance, switching in a different vocabulary or show and hide levels of detail um, just pretty much by um, artful combinations of SVG for the graphical bits and HTML for the text that you want to be able to kind of flow. Um, so that, that fusion between text and everything we've ever said about text in this course and SVG being a textual representation of graphics means that we, we've got this, uh, this potential of manipulating graphics with the same ease that we do text. And as I say, being a bit familiar with vector graphics tools, the vector graphic community 
have not produced anything um, uh, that's sort of wildly effective to solve this problem, despite many years of trying to solve it. So if I understood that correctly, I think what I heard was that you can basically use the same techniques that we're using now, um, which are um, transclusions and... Um, I can demo it, actually. Shall I do that? Yeah, but then and you can make graphics out of these elements on the fly, basically. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that it sounds more complicated than it is when I show it to you. Um, so there's an example on tiddlywiki. Oh, I'm not on tiddlywiki.com. Um, but there's uh, an example on tiddlywiki.com, which is um, this one. So you can see it changes on this curve here. And if I inspect it so go into the html behind uh you can't really see what's going on behind the scenes so instead i'll go into the source here forgive me um and um uh it's maybe a little complicated to see but um this is a macro um and um i think um uh, you're familiar with those and then this is where um we've got a text substitution of the parameter so all of that makes a text path in the middle of this SVG image um, with, uh, with the text transcluded into it. Um, another example is um, on here, we've got a, um, that's a, an SVG circle. So if I do a view source of it, you can see it's got, it looks like HTML circle, its center is at these coordinates. And there's its attributes, it's black uh, with a green inside. Um, and now here I can change this number to 25 and the circle changes. Um, and if I edit it, hopefully. Here we go. So. <clears throat> There's two elements to the demo. Um, here is the SV, um, an SVG element saying, give me an SVG of this size. Here's a circle. And we've made the radius attribute of the circle be a transclusion, a transclusion of a tiddler called that. And then just below, we've got the edit text widget pointing to the same tiddler. So when I typed a new value, that caused the edit text widget to update the store with the new number, 25 instead of 50. And then that caused an automatically the transclusion to be honored so that the radius of this SVG circle changed. So, so you, that, could write, you could write wikis that would, through templates or filters or the temperature outside that you could go get would sort of change the presentational graphics. That um, that's right. Um, and Very cool. And, you know, so, I've seen those SVGs. I never quite knew what that meant. So Jed, um, who, um, cool. uh, who you know from the group, Jed Carty, mm -hmm. um, uh, has been doing some experimentation on this. Um, and... He's incorporated a new, uh, a sort of third party library. I don't know that I can really demo it actually, but he's very good at demoing it. But basically, um, it's um, quite an extensive plugin that makes it easy to describe images with tiddlers and then to use wiki text to manipulate those tiddlers. So he's got complex animations. Well, complex animations. It's like palm trees with the sun moving around. And how those animations work is he's changing the values of tiddlers. Those changed tiddler values drive through a template um, this image expressed as a bunch of SVG primitives. So, I mean, we, we veered into the stratosphere for a hypertext course. Um, well, that's, that's so we, maybe we should try to um, relate this back to some of, the, <laughs> some of the concepts at hand. Well, it, it gets related back when... Um 
Oh, I'm looking, I don't even, yeah, it's a time. Um, it gets related back. It, are, you, are we recording that or you're recording the gallery yeah. review, right? Yeah. Yeah, not, this, not that. No. Because that's nasty. <laughs> yeah, it gets related back when we, in the second half, when students kind of pursue interesting ideas that they've picked up from the first half that they want to deepen. And one of them that I haven't touched on, but I was going to explore was something like that as a graphics and an approach. Yeah, be great. Be um, great. And now that I've, and I just didn't know quite how to get there. So I'm, I'm so text oriented, not visual, that I've been cheating that half of the tiddly weepy, the visual stuff. But I can use, now I see, and I've seen the SVG stuff, so I'm going to fold that into these signs. Uh, one of the special cases of the SVG stuff is maps. Yeah. Because maps are just images. So um, there are some extra pieces if we wanted to do kind of geo location y stuff. Um, but Eric has been working on some of that stuff. Okay. But the ability to, um, oh, hello, dog. <laughs> the ability to um, manip yes, manipulate images. I wanted to um, share with you one of the open students who's been pretty frequent in the group lately, Hagar. Um, and I wanted to share with you some pe uh, work that he's done um, and that we just talked about in class today and get your sense of it um, because it really comes to this idea of um, a multi-sequential narrative that I've been working with. Um, and then um, I think I shared my screen there. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And so um, what he's done, and I realize this is really hard to do in the in the moment, but um, We'll do it anyway. So he's created this um, structure. Um, every object, every object tiddler, and I keep using that word, and that's partly what we were going to chat about today, but we can push it to the next time, is the notion of objects and object orientation. And so these multi-sequential narratives are strings of objects. So in Julia's case, it might be strings of um, photographs of dogs or videos of training sessions. And, Here's case, it might be a bunch of plants. Um, James, I, I don't know what James is doing, okay? Um, but what Hagar did here is he just took his media collection, his, um, his um, uh, let me go back to home. He took his um, entertainment items, as he called them. Um, all of his ebooks, movies, music, TV shows, and video games that are stored in cassette, CDR, digital files, DVD, and vinyl discs that he either has borrowed slash stolen. Oh, hey, wonderful. Okay. So those are perfect, right? And then, um, and he's built um, the system that allows you to navigate from object to object, from item to item, um, not just on these tags, as we're describing, here's all the video games, but you can go to the video games and go to the next or the last or the previous or the first. So he can navigate through the dimensions. It's... Um, That's great. It looks great. Yeah, so he can navigate through dimensions of entertainment type, media, or ownership, and in a sequential, and I presume, obviously, you can control the sequence by anything. Right, I mean, there's no, there is no inherent sequence. It could, right now, it's probably alphabet because it's default to the title. But it could be, he could sort through all of the um, cassettes by alphabetical of album name. It doesn't, you know, so it doesn't, or, or whatever. You can know. you click on cassette then? Sorry, just to, so Sorry. I can see. Can, can you, you click, see? click on cassette? He only has yeah. three. That's just absolutely brilliant. Gosh, yeah. very impressed. And so the um, suggestion, my, my suggestion was to start building this structure. Um, and this is very similar um, to what we were talking about doing last fall in, if you looked at the sequentiality and hypertextuality of Phil Fitzpatrick's work on serial, um, the narrative serial, we're gonna be able to navigate that by multiple dimensions. So you've got 50 hours of audio that you can, instead of listen to it in the order in which it was released, which would be one way to do it, or each half hour show in sequence. Um, you can 
chop the show up into smaller chunks yeah. that are about different and just have a multi sequential narrative. Based well, on you, you, you know that I've been doing a lot of work on a plugin I called Text Slicer, which is yeah. with a textual equivalent, slicing a, a long text into individual tiddlers, threading them together, giving you tools for manipulating them. Um, can I um, send you a link for, sure. I mean, al alternatively, I could share, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Could, I, could I share? This is uh, in the group. I asked, um, sorry, that's the mailing list. I asked the question, is there anything else that elicits the same reaction as TiddlyWiki? In the TiddlyWiki um, group, not in the course group. I should have forwarded that yeah. thread. I'm afraid we wouldn't have wanted to see the answers quite yet. Is there anything else that... Well, um, what was interesting um, uh, was that somebody suggested something called, um, and it's a tool that I think uh, it's one of the first tools I've seen that is quite similar to TiddlyWiki. It um, it's absolutely doesn't have the same goals, um, and um, and it doesn't try to achieve. It doesn't achieve its own goals in the same way as TiddlyWiki, but um, they borrow from each other because I think both of them, both these developments have been influenced by other um, things. So, for instance, there's this looks a lot like a Tiddler um, laid out to the side, um, if you can see that. And I can um, kind of just as with TiddlyWiki, uh, I can make my own path through the data by um, clicking on clicking on links, um, the but oddly, its purpose is none of that. Its purpose is to demo a semantic search, and um, I'm not even sure that I know well enough um, how to use it in order to type in a search. But I think I can search for planets, say, okay, um, and uh, maybe big planets. I think it's no. It's, uh, oh, should I add big planets? No. Um, when I go into uh, a item, um, there's these are the different, so they call them cards, in fact, and these are the different components of a card. Um, and they roughly, um, one of them looks a lot like a field yeah. with a value. Um, and you can see that's displayed down there. And there's this idea of a list, and no, a collection, that's right. So this is basically the same user interface as we've got for tags. But how um, do you know this is not written in TiddlyWiki? Oh, because I looked inside. No, I um, <laughs> but it looks they, very much like it. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, there's, um, it has nothing like wiki text going on. Right. So it's much more, in fact, it's more like a database, and it... Um, the as far as I can tell, one of the interests of background of the people concerned is the sem is the semantic web. This idea um, that we can essentially build a big distributed database, establish enough conventions by publishing structured data, and then tools like this are viewers for kind of surfing our way through that structured data. And right. so, that's the basis of the uh, Wolfram Alpha search engine as well, right? In a sense. Um, I, I, I guess the, the, the differences between them are, I mean, the similarities between them are overwhelmed by their, by their differences. This is more, um, Tim Berners-Lee and others have kept a vigorous um, level of activity up on this idea of the semantic web for the last 15 years. So it's really where... Um, it's the part of the story of the web that has absolutely no relation to hypertext. Um, it's about um, making um, uh, databases of um, expressing knowledge in particular ways that you can then query. So it's antithetical to hypertext. Hypertext, I mean, you could, you could imagine, well, maybe there is, there is some marginal <laughs> connection. Um, you could imagine using semantic web tools to analyze a text that was written as hypertext, I guess. Um, and so this tool, I think oddly, it's got the trappings of TiddlyWiki. So it looks very similar because, but the things, the, 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 the triggers for that similarity are 
something I mentioned before, this kind of common heritage, the idea in which Tiddlywicky invents as little as possible, steals as much as possible. And we've kind of stolen from the same people. So on the web, this idea of a card, this idea of a discrete unit of information, they kind of look the same with shadows because mm -hmm. that's often done. Um, our icons kind of look the same um, because we made the same um, fashionable skinny icons and we made them gray because we didn't want them to be too prominent. Um, and so it's, and then of course, you know, there's things like this inline user interface that aren't really that similar at all. Um, so uh, I think it, it, it shows yet again, hopefully how in one sense, there's nothing special about TiddlyWiki. It just sort of mashes together a whole load of ideas that have been milling around that, and it reflects my own biases and prejudices in the first place, but then it actually reflects the needs of an extensive community, which has stopped it being made it something much more than, than my creation. Um, and it's part of a universe of tools of, you know, the Eve seems to be a really great example um, that are exploring either exploring sublim, similar problem areas, or developing similar techniques in order to explore different problem areas, which is what I think is actually going on here. So one argument is um, it would be quite interesting to see whether we could use TiddlyWiki as a alternative front end to the same um, data -y stuff that they've got. This actually entirely runs in the browser. It uses the browser's built-in database, but, um, uh, but one could imagine, I think, running it on a server, connecting TiddlyWiki to it. Interesting, yeah. So the, the, um, the topic that I wanted to chat a little bit about this morning, um, and we've, we've kind of um, gone around it a, a little bit. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, sorry, that was me. Uh, was this idea of object. Uh, and I wanted to mm. pull on your... Can I ask you some questions about what you mean by object? Yes. Um, you, mean, you mean something different than a tiddler? You mean, do you mean the kind of the, the conceptual units that are being worked on in the wiki? So... Um, that might be composed of multiple tiddlers, each one, an image yeah. and some text. So a long time ago, um, I don't know, six, eight years ago, I wrote this article based on my experience in doing web historiography. Okay, so as a web historiographer, um, the historiographer is one who comments or studies the way that other people write history. That's the field of historiography, is the study of history not the history itself, right? And so I became interested in using the web as a tool or, or using web pages, sites, objects, whatever they are, as a tool that historians were going to be using. So we started realizing this a long time ago, in the mid-90s, early 2000s, like, hey, historians are gonna have to grapple with the web. We understand how they can deal with books as historical objects and letters, we get that, we know how to deal with letters, but how do you deal with the web object? So how do you, Cite it. How do you how do you capture it? How do you save it? How do you know that the page that I'm looking at is the same as the page that other users look at? If we want to make history and write history, we have some data issues to solve. So that was the that's the field of web historiography, and um, we ultimately came up with this sort of a, a bit not really tongue in cheek, but a bit of a you know it's a title thing. You know, so we called it object oriented web historiography, and we wanted to draw attention the notion of object. So the historian has to think of objects. Historians think of artifacts, or not the same as objects. So, and what I'm doing now is I've been thinking about that. It's like, well, maybe that exact writing is useful to thinking about hypertext. So I went off and grabbed some paragraphs. So those are the ones marked off as original text. And I modified it. And I said, well, can I just take the same text and talk about hypertext? And maybe by the changes will help me figure out the similarities and differences between historiography, object-oriented historiography, and now what I might call object-oriented hypertextuality. So the objects, and you've noticed that we've talked about objects in the multi-sequential narratives, and Hagar study the objects or work, the objects were his um, entertainment items. Here it does plants, 
James does photographs of weddings or something like that. Um, Julie, I don't know what Julie does yet, but you know, she's getting it. And you can have lots of different kinds of objects as well. But if you want to run all of your objects that are grouped together, you group them with a tag. So it's all, so that's what holds a set of objects together probably is a tag. And then if you want to present them in a certain way, you can run them through template. But, um, so I'm wondering whether, so I wanted to kind of look at this. So there's two ways that we approach objects. Um, I wrote this with a partner, a research partner, Kirsten Foote, um, and we worked together for many years, and um, we were good partners because she knew stuff that I didn't get, and I knew stuff that she didn't get. Part of this is hers, part of this is mine. You're going to figure out which I understand, which she kind of contributed, but this first part is hers, right? This notion of object is motive, um, which I understand in a different way, having done this work earlier this week. Um, it's like the, um, what is the objective? What is your objective in doing this history? Your objective as a historian, that's your object. What is your motive? What is your goal? And I'm thinking that maybe understanding objects, Hitler's objects, will help us understand our goals in writing hypertextual. Like, well, what are you trying to do? And what you're trying to do as a writer or as a hypertextual creator, as one who's creating interactive text, what your your own motives give rise to certain behaviors. And they so the way who you are and what you're trying to accomplish structures of what you end up accomplishing. Um, and maybe readers too. It's like readers come to a text with a goal in mind. And what they can do, it involves their own need states at the moment. Um, and that last sentence is really important to me there. It gives rise to particular motives that differ among readers working with the same pool of objects. So clearly your readers are going to come to your text with different need states. Yet they have to work with the same text, but they have to solve different problems with that text. In a standard linear text, it's like, here's the book. You're on your own. You solve your own kind of problems. And you think about that, but you don't really write a whole lot of structure in your book to facilitate readers with different need states. A little bit, but you kind of say, okay, everyone's roughly the same, but in hypertext and in the wiki, you really have to maybe want to accommodate different people. Maybe through templating. Like, what language do you speak? Oh, I'll change my language for you based on what you need. Um, and then also a single reader may have different need states over a period of time. So when you came to design right for the first time, you were in one neat state. When you go to it now, you're in a very different situation. You know what you're looking for, you can get there. So that was a, so that's a, that's the object as, of, as motive. And then the, um, and then my half of the work is really the Tiddler's object. Um, like what are, um, what is a Tiddler? And this comes to, and this is where I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, to, to maybe kick in a little bit. Uh, and this comes to, I don't know if, if, if Tiddlers have these characteristics of encapsulation and polymorphism and inheritance. And I think they don't, which I think is really interesting. And I realize I'm just dumping this stuff on you late. So we, we'll pick it up, if, if, you know, if, if you want to, if you don't want to play with Okay. It. So, um, uh, I interest you have ended up where I wondered where you, whether you were going to touch on this. So, um, object orientation is a phrase in computer science, and it. Um, this is where you get that object is motive is not computer science. <laughs> no, object is motive requires me to, you know, have to parse that stuff quite carefully to yeah. to, to think I understand it. But, yeah. It's interesting, but it doesn't. I think it's really interesting for us to think about, and I'd love to see the next set of assignments. The next assignment where. You're well, the, the, the thing I recognized in motive is the way that hypertext is much better able to serve the needs of different audiences than simultaneously than other types of writing. And so I, that's a rather mechanistic reflection of what I heard in that motive part. But, um, but m m moving to the other part, the, the computer science -y part, um, uh, I, I'm not sure that this is a great analogy. The trouble is, that object orientation means very specifically the, the, the stuff about classes and instances of classes and subclasses. And we do have something of the same effect in templating. 
um, that templating um, gives us this idea of um, defining a behavior, having lots of instances of it, changing one place and you change lots of instances. But it's really a very superficial resemblance with classical object orientation because classical object orientation being a classical concept has such a frighteningly specific meaning. So it's probably okay here because we're not, we're not computer scientists, but I think I can only, I make more sense of what you're saying if I can think of object orientation, um, not as a, in, a, in, in, in computer science sense, but more in a pun um, of you're describing a behavior, a way of thinking um, that amusingly echoes a computer science concept. Um, and that way of thinking, I quite like it because um, I think what I'm seeing with the examples you list is a rather curious thing that you, many, the wikis that we're looking at, they have objects which are semantically significant tiddlers, but they're not necessarily individual tiddlers. So it's the result that maybe of some mismatch between our cognitive needs are uh, that we have semantic units as so items of entertainment, for instance, and cats and photographs of goats and all that kind of thing. Um, and yet within TiddlyWiki, each of those objects is actually implemented as multiple tiddlers. So there's a bunch of sentences that we'd like to be go backwards and forwards to the next tiddler. But it's a wee bit confusing because we're not actually navigating between tiddlers. We're navigating between objects, which are these conceptually higher level thing, higher level things that you that you have in the wikis that we're looking at here. So you don't think of tiddlers as objects? Not in the classical sense, you see, because I'm I'm of the post object oriented generation of computer scientists. I mean, gosh, no, I'm not a computer scientist. What no, no. I... So what is that called? Um, we, um, JavaScript, um, for instance, um, uh, uses something called prototypal inheritance, uh -huh. which is an alternative to, it's a completely orthogonal way of looking at the universe from classical inheritance. You can use the primitives that JavaScript provides to build classical object-oriented inheritance if you want to, or something very similar to it. But it's not how JavaScript does it innately. And there is an argument that this idea of prototypal inheritance is much closer to the way that human brains work, where we basically say this new thing is essentially that old thing that I've already got stored away in my brain, plus these differences, which we can enumerate. Um, and prototypal inheritance basically is that. It's saying this thing not is the same as this class of things, but it's the same as that specific thing over here. So to the students, Jeremy is the same as Steve, minus being on a different, not being in the same room, um, plus being English, you know, those kinds of things. So there's a, there's a, um, the relationship that is established is between instances of things, and there is no concept of classes. Classes are just sort of implied by the existence of a bunch of similar things. Okay. So, and so that way of thinking much more closely. For me, um, when object-oriented development came in, it basically was one of many things that ushered in the town planners, the people who, you know, to put it in a kind of teenage way, who are so terrified of programming um, and failing um, that they spend all this time pre-planning. And object in classical object orientation, you make this kind of template of a bit like the Georges Louis Bourges um, category thing. Um, do you know this? Uh, um, the categories of fantastical creatures. Um, uh, you you end up with these insane. Um, yes, sorry, that distracted me because I was googling Georges Louis Bourges in the background. <laughs> I can't really multitask to the extent of googling and speaking at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so forgive me. Um, uh, I, 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 so, in other words, um, I'm post-object orientation, therefore TiddlyWiki doesn't, it, it does in a couple of places use object-oriented concepts, but mostly it doesn't. It mostly has this prototypal inheritance idea. Um, and it's a really bad idea. What is? <laughs> my, 
no, it's not that it's a bad idea. No, it's a joke. Um, as I say, the best way I can read it it's is a it's a hilarious joke because <laughs> you are also hilariously well informed about software development mores and you know i mean look what's happened in fact object orientation is not that it's become discredited it's that when it was introduced it was believed to be some kind of magical silver bullet and there was also there was a fondness for doing it very vigorously and rigorously whereas now some things you could look at and say yeah that's a bit object oriented but it's a bit like you know, rapping used to be a distinct style of music and then it just got assimilated into everything else. And so object orientation, in, one, in another sense, therefore, it, it is, um, the concept has been weakened because we find it everywhere. Um, you know, the, and and that, the, the weak sense of object orientation, of thinking in terms of discrete, encapsulated, well-encapsulated objects, you know, that's, one is permeated everywhere, just like we've re remarked that hypertext has won and permeated everywhere. So it's good. It's good for a um, an analogy, but not particularly useful. Other than focusing people's attention on understanding groups of titlers as sort of objects, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah. That. I think in James's work, he, I saw his definition of hyper hyper writing. I think well, I've lost your sound. Oh, you're back. Um, yeah, I saw James's definition of hyper writing a little while ago, which I was I, I couldn't figure out quite why it wasn't right. But I think he had the word nodes in it, and that's a that's a different word that we might not want to use. Uh, you know, just thinking through these these words, I think are important because they help. But the, the, those, the, all of those comments are about object orientation. To speak. Brief the um, so those words and what they connote in computer science. But you, your central idea is thinking in terms, and um, that I think is about this sort of units of cognition and the fact that once you get deeply into using tiddlywiki, tiddlywiki demands that the unit of cognition is the tiddler when you're building tiddlywiki. But the things that you build with tiddlywiki often have a unit of cognition that's different. So, for instance, my text splicing thing that cuts documents up into lots of tiddlers. So the object there is absolutely clearly, there's these objects which are documents. They're each composed of a whole bunch of tiddlers threaded together. So I think that concept is very strong. Um, the, the idea that um, in, as we use tiddlywiki, we develop the idea of a particular, within a particular application, we develop the idea of an object that's a superset of a tiddler, that's the domain-specific cognitive unit. Um, and tiddlywiki's mechanism demanding that we create tiddlers here and there means that there's almost never a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but, when, I, you know, I, but then having said that, I quite like when you're working in a, a very simple, empty wiki, so to speak, there is absolutely a one-to-one -one correspondence there between your tiddlers and your objects. Yeah. So, okay, well, thank you. That was... Um as always, unexpected, but quite informative. Um, That's great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so we will, next week we're on spring break, but I'll send you some email and we'll chat offline a little bit about um, the oh, brilliant. following that. Well, everybody have a great spring break. I've seen lots of um, movies, Hollywood movies, where people go and do shenanigans on spring break, so I'll yeah, be expecting so. that. Cheers then. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.